Now I just get to pre-roll for a bit. Mute that. Oh man, wonderful. I have people in a chat. This is exciting. I think this is the first time I've ever prepared to do a thing and I had like a time where it had to launch. This is very exciting. All right. It looks like everything is going to be live. And we have a Luke and a Jade and a Barry and Blake and daughter who I don't know or don't have a connection to. This is awesome. This is like, this is, this is as close as I get to a birthday party. I'm very excited. Um, all right. Let me pre-roll myself in here. And uh, we'll see what we do. Uh, good evening. Welcome to uh, whatever this is. This is a part of the Drawing Out, Drawing the Owl pilot season. This is probably going to be like a little mini Drawing the Owl. I guess I would call it an owlet. Um, it is. It's just the the first three circles. Um, it's not. It falls in with the other unscripted stuff, and it's uh, done with a couple of wonderful people, which is great because it means that I get to have all of your mm, delicious opinions and we get to learn from each other, which is very exciting. Um, my name is Sydney Acris. I use they, them pronouns. I am a struggling tabletop game designer, and I make content about how much I struggle designing tabletop games. Uh, it is good fun. Um, this, this is, as I said, part of the pilot season, which means I don't really know what this is going to be, but it kind of all came out of a single tweet. But before that, we should talk about assumed knowledge. What is the assumed... Because some people are going to be into this as their first thing. I think the only assumed knowledge we're going to talk about here is some familiarity with d and I think I can't, I can't start at the beginning there. So uh, assumed knowledge will be... Um, D&D &D and uh, 5th edition specifically and how it engages with um, with the people whom play it. Um, so this all comes off an original tweet that I did. Uh, it's something that's been sitting in my head for a while. Um, okay, let me go back through my series of retweets and find this original tweet. Uh, I can even do this because we're doing this. Hey, look at this. Look how exciting this is. Um, whoa, oof, bad. bad this. Um, so I woke up with the reason that trad RPGs, especially D&D 5e, have such a poor relationship with character failure is because they have no idea of stakes or jeopardy in any way. That was my D&D cops. Um, so this is this was a this was kind of a six forty a.m. I'd had about an hour and a half of sleep during the night. Um, I was sick. I wasn't sleeping. I had work work in like three hours. Um, I was kind of feverish, and uh, I wrote that. And it's it's actually been coming out of my experience with modules more and more. Um, and I've been going back to D and D modules and five e modules, and there's something that's really been frustrating me. And I think. Uh, I think I'll tell you the story of that in a second. But first, I'm going to sort of break down what that tweet actually means to me. We should bring it back up because it's a good thing to have uh, on screen while we do it. Um, okay. So what I think it really means is um, the reason that D&D &D 5e, uh, the reason that when playing it, failure feels so bad as a player is because it's rare that as a player, I understand the uh, implicit consequences of that failure. Um, I'm using this term jeopardy. And uh, jeopardy is kind of like it, within a story, it's the, it's the hazard, it's the risk, it's the danger. Um, and I think that players are really unclear how their failures, how their failed roles or, or failed decisions impact um, the long-term macro uh, hazards of, a, of an adventure. Um, so let's let's talk about the first the first chapter of Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, hashtag spoiler alert. I want to kind of be aware that 
um, this, I really don't want this to turn into um, you cheated not only the game, but yourself. You didn't learn anything. You didn't grow. Um, I don't want to be the kind of person who's assessing people as bad, wrong, fun. And um, I also want to acknowledge that, that okay, I, I as, a, as a critic and as a developer, but specifically as a critic, which is the hat I'm wearing at the moment, I believe that um, that the way that we interpret text is as important as the text as text itself. I'm a very big fan of the of the death of the author theory, um, and that as a reading. Uh, however, when when I am interpreting the text like this, I can't get tangled around the axles of. But at your table, it might be a different experience. And at some other table, it might be a different experience. I have to kind of take the text for what it is um, because it would be uh, it, it would be um, unfair in my position as a, as, a, as a critic if I had to acknowledge the broad space, the broad space that play culture brings to um, games. Uh, and Luke, I think you're spot on there that um, the game is super unclear on that at a design level. The game is really unclear um about how much individual roles affect the story and that's that's something that i want to talk about later micro into macro um so what a deep dragon heist was the uh adventure that was released last year i think and um i've got myself a pdf here and in the first chapter um, the players are looking for a character named Floon. Uh, and when they find Floon, not if, but when, um, they they track him. Um, so we've got this tracking Floon section. Um, they, at some point, will find out that he was kidnapped by the Xanathar Guild and they will go and find him and they'll go through the sewers and they'll fight some bad guys and they'll take on a mind flare and they'll do all this really cool stuff and then right at the end um there's this section here which uh i will zoom in on further um it says that as a result of of grumshaw's torture floon blagma fuck i love i fucking love like fantasy names hey um as a result of apostrophe's torture floon blagma has one hit point left if he is healed by the characters he is eternally grateful and shows his affection by hugging them um okay this is this is the bit that bothers me is that um the game has set this in stone that uh when you meet floon he will have one hit point left and it means that at no point throughout it um at no point throughout the tracking at no point throughout the sneaking through sewers to avoid being heard by the torturer at no point uh in the early bits where you're like trying to find out where he's gone because he's been missing for a long time um it's it's never any failures that players have um, in their uh, investigation roles or their um, persuasion roles to get someone to give them information or their constitution roles to have a uh, drinking contest with a sailor so that he'll open up with his, his loose lips. Um, at no point does this impact the outcome of the system that, that Floon is always found with one hit point and uh he is like we are always just in time and it's perfectly dramatic but it means that the players really are having no impact on the story um the okay there was a comment that was made a long time ago i don't actually know if i if i have this up i don't I don't have it up and I can't find it now. Um, but it was made a long time ago talking about World of Warcraft and it was talking about how um, area design in World of Warcraft changed from being a um, a sandbox type adventure where they dropped you in and said, like, go find the adventure to being a theme park where you go in and you get led and like quest leads to quest leads to quest and there's cutscenes and you as the as the player um, living through the avatar of your character achieve heroic things. Um, and the comment that was made is it feels like a theme park ride referring to like small world type um, uh, 
to, to like a small world type um, ride where you sit in the boat and it goes and it does stuff. And at the end of it, like all the way through it, people are like, oh, you're such a hero because you're doing the good things. But at the end, none of the decisions that you've made actually matter because uh, the boat was always going there in the first place. I see theme park design is strictly different to railroad design in ways that I kind of don't want to go into here because it's um, it's going to drag me away from my original point. But uh, I think that we have this big argument about like sandbox versus railroad. Uh, and there's this kind of third type that not enough people talk about, which is this theme park. And in the theme park particularly, the big issue is that players are not or player characters are not empowered characters. Player characters are brought places um, by the plot and the plot unravels itself to them rather than, say it with me, Luke, we play to find out what happens. Uh, and, and Luke, you're exactly right. Um, in a tense narrative sequence, yeah, count, like I, I think what you're saying there, Luke, is that in a tense narrative sequence, we would expect failure to amount to any consequence or are you saying that that this is what we should expect, that because the narrative sequence is so tense, failure can't amount to any consequence. I will let you hit the lag on that um, and we'll come back to it. Um, and so we're talking about this word consequence a lot and I want to talk about perceivable consequence and the difference between, between consequences and perceivable consequences. And the difference is that for players, at a player level, a perceivable consequence is one where the boundings of the outcome is at least moderately predictable. Um, a really good example of this is given in an errant signal video, uh, which I will put in the description at a later point, but I've mentioned on Twitter, uh, where he talks about video games and, and perceivable consequence in video games. And he says that sometimes it can be as simple as you push left on, on the keyboard and your character turns left, you push right on the keyboard, your character turns right, that's a perceivable consequence. Um, and it can be as, as um, distinct and deep as um, if we fail this role, Floon gets closer to death. Um, and and so, okay, so like whether this is an adventure design issue or a, or a system issue is something that I do want to come to later um, because it does come up. I, I think it is an adventure design issue, but I'm not sure that D&D &D has the tools in the system to make it uh, a good, to, to make a good adventure. Um, the first thing, tension narratively implies high stakes, so we feel into it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes, this is my absolute thing. Yes, tension narratively implies high stakes. Um, and being protagonist implies that we have an impact on the stakes. And so um, linking this back to perceivable consequence, um, one of the issues that we have is that um, the, the game, the adventure, the system never communicates what uh the consequences could be so we know that floon's missing right so we know that his death is a perceivable consequence but it actually isn't and it's and it's a bit of an illusion and it's a it's a, it's a really cheap illusion and it's not one that we should be leaning on that's something that you can kind of get away with in video games because you're so constrained by cost and you have to build illusionary choices in because every new choice you put in costs you so much more but we really don't. I'll, I'll talk more about that, actually. We'll, we'll pin that for now. Um, I want to just quickly bring up Hitchcock's bomb theory, which is a big part of how I view suspense. It's not really necessary for you to understand it to get what I'm saying, but it is uh, something that's very um, important to me. And that is that um, Hitchcock does this really good interview. Alfred Hitchcock, legendary horror director, um, uh, oh, thriller director, um, does this interview where he says, Imagine that we are talking at a table, there's a bomb underneath the table, it explodes, the audience is surprised. Um, now imagine that there's a bomb underneath the table, but we've seen the anarchist plant it. And we saw them um, put the the um, code in for one o'clock. And we see that the clock in the background is at a quarter to one. And it's about building that suspense because it makes the audience, which in this case are the players, which in this case are also your characters, um, it makes them feel like they want to have an impact on that situation because they understand what is about to happen should no action be taken. And that 
that to me is the real key. It's perceivable consequence means that you have to both understand what is going to happen should you do nothing and then what your actions could do to change that. Uh, Finbar, how do you view this issue appearing in the broader design of D&D an issue in written modules? Oh, um, I will talk to that later, I promise. Please remind me. I'm doing the nose thing, so I should remember. Um, I'm going to put this in my... Okay. Finbar goes here. Um, okay, so win states. Win states are interesting because perceivable consequence means that we're driving towards something, right? If we have two consequences, then we need to know which one we kind of want to draw drive towards. And that's that's all that's saying. So um, in order to have perceivable consequence, we need to have a win state. And that's where like quests usually come in in D&D, which is like, um, uh, if you rescue Floon, I will be grateful and pay you and reward you is a win state. So we know that rescuing Floon alive is, is, is a positive thing. And we know that outcome one is we do nothing and Floon dies. And we know that outcome two is we do something else and Floon lives. And so we want to push towards that. And should we fail, importantly, should we fail, we kick back and Floon dies and we don't get our reward. And that's a big part of the issue with this design. Um, so that's the perceivable part. And the consequences part is really interesting because in D&D, and this is something that um, Kyle brought up really well on that uh, on that Twitter thread. Um, I will actually find it because it's that good. And it's easy to find. Um, I would say that's true of 5e once you hit third level. And even then there's no nuance to the stakes. It's just, will they TPK us? Um, a fifth edition character has three resources. They have health, they have gold, and they have time. Um, time is kind of the manifestation of things like spell slots. Um, so spell slots are time. Uh, action surge is a time. Druid's wild shape is a time. Barbarian's rage is time. And it's because they come back on certain rests. Um, these are all interchangeable because you can trade time for health when you rest and spend hit dice. You can trade health for time when you go into a fight and don't use your big spells and take some, some hits instead. You can trade gold for time when you buy a spell scroll instead of using a slot. You can trade gold for health when you um, buy a potion. Uh, it's the, the three economies of a of a fifth edition D and D character: health, gold, and time. The issue is that they are the only things that you can leverage, and in fifth edition, um, as as consequences, in fifth edition, um, health is really fucking hard. It is really hard to kill characters, and after Kyle says third level, um, after about fifth or sixth level, it is fucking trivial to resurrect characters. It is so easy. It's like a thousand gold and a spell slot, or it's like, know someone, have have someone, someone. Um, yep, you trade time and health for gold when you're an adventurer. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, spot on that. That's the primary exchange there, Luke. Uh, um, when you go out adventuring and you go into combat and you kill things and you take their stuff, you're trading time and health for gold. Um, but there's also fictional implications. And this is something that really interests me because I don't know the answer to this. So I'm really interested to hear what you think. Our characters go off an adventure and they come back and they have missed that there's an evil lich in the town and the town is burnt down. Is that a consequence? And I don't know because it doesn't impact any of the characters actual stats. If we're not talking about um, it doesn't endogenously impact the characters. If we're not talking about like they lost a blacksmith that can do masterwork or whatever, or like they lost someone that can teach them spells. I'm just talking about like fictionally, they lose a, a, a blacksmith who's like a real cool, cool person, like just, just fucking cool. Um, is that a consequence? And <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Luke, Luke has hit exactly the point that I was at, which is like, we can't spend gold there. We can't endogenously draw something from it. And and I think there is, like, I think I think that's, this is a very, um, 
play culture question uh, where like sometimes um, players will feel really consequential about that and sometimes they won't. Um, I do say at one point, uh, something that's really interesting to me, is the end of the world a consequence? And I don't think it is because um, I don't think a TPK is really a consequence either because if everyone dies and we stop playing and we like finish the adventure, right? If it's Curse of Strahd and we've decided that once all the characters die, that's it, and everyone dies at once, it's not really a consequence because there's not really like... The game isn't continuing. It's not something that we can experience, continue to experience. I guess there's the idea of the lost game, that like the the game that we could have had maybe. Um, but I think, yeah, being told, no, you can't play anymore, like the world has ended, is a really interesting consequence that I haven't really come to terms with. Um, uh yeah so that is that is what i believe to be about perceivable consequences is perceivable consequences is when players can see how it would affect their character in either their health their gold their time uh and can make decisions to affect that that's that is dnd 5e perceivable consequence we took half an hour to get in there i'm so sorry um and then the other end of this spectrum is because these are all implicit consequences, right? It's like rescue Floon and they shall be rewarded. And you realize as you go that like maybe when you find his body, you're like, oh man, Floon's dead. We're not gonna get our reward. That's that's an that's an implicit consequence. Um, things like powered by the apocalypse, where um, the move itself has certain consequences. I did say that D and D five E was gonna be our only. Thing. So let's bring up a PPTA move. Um, Monster Hearts. I do love Monster Hearts. Okay. Um, good morning, card hobbyist. Thank you for joining us to talk about um perceivable consequences and fifth edition at the moment we're just looking at um explicit consequence so lash out physically is a move from monster hearts 2 um when you lash out physically it's the same as attacking someone you roll with a stat called volatile um these are your consequences on a turn up you deal them harm and they choke up momentarily before they can react that is a perceivable well that's not that's not just a perceivable consequence that is explicit um oh, hey pat good to see you mate on a seven to nine, you harm them, but you choose one. Uh, these are all um, explicit. This this is kind of an implicit consequence, or at least an implied consequence, and this uh, is explicit. Um, the important thing about this uh, is just, I'm just showing the difference between um, saying to a crew, uh, go and go and rescue Floon and, and I shall reward you, and having a move which says um, when you rescue someone from harm gain 10 gold um is really very little there there really is very little difference between them it's just in how we communicate it and a lot of communication from dnd is done through um uh understandings through implications through like uh what would you call it cultural baggage i'm sure there's a better word for it but like tropes uh through tropes um okay so that's that's consequence but we really came here to talk about failure so let's talk about if people have questions stuff as we go please hit me up they've been good so far and i can't wait to get to um to fin there um traditional failure so traditional failure or failure in oh uh, i always feel like consequences don't flow from player roles in DD. the rules and culture tend to be the failure of checks means you don't do it yes you're my fave. I, I really, I really like you because we are. This is exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, I will, I will even bring this up so that we can be best friends. Um, look at this. Tradition of failure stops the story. Uh, it's fail safe, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about fail safe roles. So, um, traditional failure uh, is you don't do it. Um, I uh, am playing my. Um, Dragonborn Paladin, I roll to attack the giant. Uh, I get a two. I don't do it. 
there there are no other consequences from it. This is what I'm calling fail safe, which is um, a mechanics and engineering term about um, uh, equipment that um, when it fails, when it loses power or loses control, um, returns to a safe position where there are no consequences for the people using it. So this is a fail, fail safe role. Um, what that kind of means is that trad module play is also traditionally fail safe um, because of the way that plots tend to be written. Uh, an example of, of this is um, the uh, Tomb of Annihilation adventure. The danger is actually out there and you as players go seeking it because you want reward. Um, you, you, you exist in a safe space and you go in search of, um, of danger and you make actions, you take actions in order to put yourself in further danger. But should you fail, um, if we're at the Tomb of Annihilation and we have to, um, try to open the magic door to get in and the wizard does an arcana check, traditional, traditional D&D 5e failure rules say nothing happens. And that means that the, the, the party is safe, is more safe than they were before. Um, the even more so than than on a miss the mc makes a move luke uh because that's that's a so that's your really micro version of it is is the dnd it's uh, the um the pbta version of remember we're going to oh okay i was gonna bring up the monster hearts one but it's not in the text of the monster hearts one um but on a six minus um your mc makes a reaction makes a move against you your mc I said I said that we wouldn't have. Here we go. Reactions. I'm sure everyone knows the Monster Hearts two reactions by heart in here, but let's bring them up anyway because they're fun. Um, on a on a six minus, your MC decides to inflict harm as established, or enact drastic measures, or herald the abyss. Um, they do something that is bad for you. Uh, even put them together as nice as it looks is not is not a gentle thing and a generous thing. Um, so traditionally moves are fail safe, um, PBTA or indie, um, I guess PBTA more accurately, indie's too broad, they fail deadly. What I want to talk about as well is dogs in the vineyard because dogs in the vineyard at a macro level is fail deadly. Dogs in the vineyard is a game about being religious inquisitors who go into towns and hunt demons. Um, the important thing about dogs in the vineyard is that as a as a gm when you're building the town you decide what happens if the dogs never came so um each each town uh has this step of sin so it begins with pride um, where people feel like they deserve more than they do. And then it's injustice where they see someone else as being between them and their success. And then there's sin, which is they do something that is against the rules because they are trying to rectify their pride or that injustice. Um, and they feel justified for doing it because it's injustice. Then there's demonic attacks, um, which is uh, depending depending on how you want to play dogs in the vineyard uh demonic attacks every anything from like actual hauntings and like people seeing things to um uh crops dying or maybe there's like you know not, not a lot of rain or maybe an animal dies in the water in the in the um in the water tower and their water is poisoned all of those are like metaphors for the demons um and then we get false doctrine, which is um, the people who have been sinning believe that they, they they create false theology to justify the sin. They they justify it to themselves and to others, and that's corrupt worship. Um, once you get a few people together, you have a false priesthood. That's three people. Uh, a false priesthood together can invoke the demons to create sorcery, and then sorcery inevitably leads to hate and murder. Um, 
So step step six C on this creating a town is if the dogs never came, what would happen? What's the next step in the what's wrong ladder? Write a sentence or two. I'll show you an example of it um, for the uh, Box Elder Canyon branch. Um, but basically what this means is that the entire situation is fail deadly. If, if your players say, um, like, we choose not to get involved or we... Um, Okay, so two things that are really important about this before I go any further. One, players and characters know this progression. It is it is a part of the religious culture, which means that both players and characters know that if they don't stop the sin, they will... get Adrian. Um, if they don't stop the sin, they will um, uh, lead to hate and murder. That's, that's something that they know to be true. Um, so they can perceive that consequence. The second thing they know is that there is a way to stop it because because they are dogs, because they are religious inquisitors, because they can do anything they want and call it doctrine. And because they have that religious fervor, they know there's a way to stop the sin. So they're, they're the two things. Inaction has a perceivable consequence. They are so much smarter than me. Um, so in um, the uh, Box Elder Canyon branch, um, the, um, oh man, I need to bring it up. I need to bring it up so that I can talk about it. Okay, here it is. Um, because he spends time, uh, pestering the town for more money instead of working, um, his wife and children are dead poor, so he needs more money. The territorial authority, the territorial authority of people who are outside the religion, it's like a local sheriff, um, makes whiskey and sells it to the town's farmhands on the sly to make money. Um, demonic attacks. Oh, God, look, I've, I've seen that solution more than once and it's phenomenal. It's my fave. Um, it's my best favorite for um, Willow Bluff, actually. It's the best. Um, the church meeting house burns down, uh, which is a demonic attack. Um, there's false doctrine, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so... Corrupt worship. We finish here at corrupt worship. Brother Benjamin's burned uncle has taken to ceremonially praying for the steward's grandmother's death. This is this is corrupt worship, but it's not yet. Um, it's it's not yet three people, so it's just one person. So it's not yet a cult, and it's not yet sorcery because they're not. He's not actually invoking the demons to do it. He's just praying. But this is the important bit down here. After we talk about all the people, we get to if the dogs never came. Sooner or later, the cult would get its three members. They'd overthrow the steward, the demons whisper to them, the grandmother gets murdered. And that is fail deadly. And that is why inherently dogs in the vineyard is better at perceivable consequence than 5e in the way that the system's written. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, so... That is failure. So we've done perceivable consequence. We've done failure, but now we need to kind of break failure into micro goals and macro goals. Um, cool. Because the issue with a fail safe system, okay, um, a fail deadly system breaks micro failure and, oh, sorry, connects micro failure and macro failure very easily. Here's what I mean by those. I roll a, a an athletics check and I fail is a micro failure. We fail to rescue Floon and he dies is a macro failure. That That is like a spectrum. Um, but that's what I'm talking about when I talk about micro and macro. So in a fail deadly system, it's really easy as both a GM and a player to perceive and therefore to enact how uh, a micro failure turns into a macro failure. For example, um, the territorial authority guy who is selling whiskey, when my characters go up to him and say, I want to persuade him to stop making whiskey because it's the right thing to do, and they fail their role, God, dogs in the vineyard, uh, conflict resolution is more difficult than that. But when they do, I, as the GM, and my players, and my characters all know 
where this is going. And so we know what the, we know the bounded outcomes of that failure. This is something that's lacking from D&D 5e. Because, because what Floon's life means, okay, especially because D&D is so obsessed with keeping secrets from players, but because what Floon's life means to the characters is unknown and unknowable, the stakes of the micro failure cannot relate to the macro failure. Here's, a, here's an example, okay? There is a scene where the players can go into a bar and they can drink with locals and the locals will eventually give up that they saw some things and that will lead the, the characters or the players um, to where Floon is. The role that can be made is to have that happen much quicker. Um, basically, the game understands that a regular fail-safe system would not be acceptable here, so it's just going to give you the information. But the question is, do you get it, or do you have to spend a bit of gold, or do you have to spend a bit of time? Remember those three three things. Maybe, you know, do you have to beat someone up for it? Do you have to spend a bit of gold to get it, or do you have to spend time? Or can you roll and bypass those? Cool. The issue is that as a player, it doesn't mean anything. When they just say, yeah, uh, you'll have to drink with them all night to get that information. As a player, I do not have enough information to perceive what that consequence actually means. Is flu near death? Is, uh, like, do we have a lot of time? Is, are, do, are we talking minutes, not hours? And, and if we spend a couple of hours drinking, we will get there to like find his his corpse already gone. This kind of decision making process can't be done at the player level because the system and the adventure module, neither of them give that information to the players or give them the tools to make those decisions. Uh, and that is what I mean by a fail safe system struggles to link micro goal, micro failure and macro failure, whereas a failed deadly system cannot help but link them. As a matter of fact, um, failed deadly systems, um, you kind of have to get in the way to stop perceivable consequence from happening, which means that um, it's, it's often in this really good space. There's, there's this really good emotional thing that happens in every, um, in every PBTA game. Uh, I've seen it happen you know, and it's and it's this beautiful moment when we will go back to the same move. We we lash out physically. Um, so, Monster Hearts is a game about um, uh, teenagers who are given metaphors of um, horror tropes as um, sorry as a, are given horror tropes as a metaphor for teenagerness. So, the ghost is the person who feels very shy, and the werewolf is the person who feels their burgeoning toxic masculinity puberty. So that's what this is about, which is a failed deadly system because in Monster Hearts, there's always something going on. There's always a ball, uh, there's always like a prom happening that, you know, we're not ready for or whatever. But when you lash out physically, you roll with volatile and something that'll happen all the time when I play these games is we'll get a seven to nine and the player, when it comes to choosing one, will say, it has to be. I become my darker self because the, those are the stakes as we understand it. Um, the player will be like, they'll look at this thing of three. They won't even consider it on an endogenous level. They'll just think about the, the story, about the narrative, about the perceivable consequences that they understood going into this um, move. And they'll say, look, everything else aside, as much as I would love you to kill this guy and for it to be, you know, you decide how bad the harm turns out because that would be fun. True to, the, true to the narrative, true to the perceivable consequences, I become my darker self. I think that is right. And that is, um, that is something that is so beautiful about micro failure um, being extrapolated by the players into macro failure without the GM even having to whisper it to them.
Um, okay, Luke, the game implies we have finite time but doesn't elaborate and we actually have unlimited time. See, this is the problem, is that is that it's a it's a lie, right? Like it's a distinct lie. And I don't mind the illusion of choice. I will talk about that. I will talk about unlimited time in a second. Um, Blake, is it harder because D and D scope situation is broader than many PBTA? Okay, is it harder? <sighs> yes, it is, because D and D's moves are not game structures designed to solve narrative problems. D and D's actions are simulationist constructions designed to see if something happens in the fiction. Um, here's a really good example. Worldwide Wrestling is a PBTA game about a wrestling match, about a you know small um, crew of wrestlers putting on a show. When you roll a move in Worldwide Wrestling, <clears throat> the stakes are never do we pull this move off? The stakes are almost always, what does the audience think of this? The important thing there, the, the important thing about that is that worldwide wrestling is not trying to simulate, can you hit the dragon with your sword? Worldwide wrestling is trying to simulate, how cool does it look when you hit the dragon with your sword? So is it harder because the D&D scope and situation is broader? I don't think it's because it's broader. I think it's because it's trying to do something different. This is the lie that D&D has always told us. We have six stats and we have 18 skills, so we can do anything. Anything that you can imagine fits within those. And what that means is that we don't actually care about the narrative beat. What we care about is within the fiction, can you achieve the thing? That's why That's why you get those fuckheads who are like, I roll to seduce the table. I got a natural 20. Those people, those people are playing hard into that simulation of stuff, right? You can't, you, you can't in Monster Hearts, like, turn someone on a table because it's not part of the narrative beat of the move. Um, so I don't think it's that it's broader. I think it's that they're trying to do different things. Um, yeah, Adrian, I will, I will talk about Avery, like, just top to bottom. Uh, she's amazing, and I love uh, a lot of what she makes. And I disagree with her about a lot of stuff too, so it's a wonderful experience. Um, okay, Pat, yes, F uh, Trad Fail also stalls the conversation. So this this is beautiful. This is this is something very true. Um, a player attempts to do something, fails, and then has to do the labor to make another decision without situation changing. This is the problem with um, combat. It's the problem with opening the door to the Tomb of Annihilation, the magic door, with the two ritual marks on the side, and you're like, I use Arcana, and the DM says, you rolled a two. It's not good enough. And we're like, okay, so, like, so what? I break the door down. Well, you rolled a two as well. And we just sit there. We just sit there jerking ourselves off for 45 minutes until someone finally rolls a natural 20 on some skill with, like, six different assists and an inspiration die and all that shit and bardic inspiration. And we finally get there. And it's like... And it's, and yeah, it's it's absolutely because failing safe stops the conversation. Failing deadly continues the conversation. Um, Adrian, eleven moments of failure for characters gives the player a meaningful choice to make. Yes, okay, okay. This is the thing, meaningful choice. So, a choice can only be meaningful when we understand both the inputs and the outputs. Here's a, here's a really cool example that I love. I love the Stanley Parable. Stanley Parable is a video game uh, where you play a guy in an office and you walk down a hall and there's two doors, a left door and a right door. That is not a meaningful choice. Left door or right door is not a meaningful choice. What happens though is um, Stephen Fry, or someone who sounds like Stephen Fry, um, comes over the radio, the, the, the broad narrative voice and says, um, Stanley, your character walked through the left door. All of a sudden, we have a meaningful choice because it doesn't matter where they where they lead. What matters is that whether we obey or disobey, and that that is that is what makes choice meaningful. So, um, 
Adrian, when you say, when you say, um, I love when moments of failure give players a meaningful choice to make, I think what we're saying is, I love when moments of failure provide characters with enough information to act and and to create inputs in order to generate certain outputs. And I love that. In D&D, &D, a failure means you stop interacting with the system. That's so true. Um, PBTA, one of my favorites is Night Witches. I will talk about Night Witches until the cows come home. Um, you, uh, World War II women um, flying World War I planes, like you're just getting just wrecked by the Soviet army, um, but you're flying for them. And when you fly over and you drop bombs on the Nazis, you roll. And when you get a seven to nine or a six minus, you get enemy fire. And enemy fire is another move. And it's another chance for you to be cool, but it's also another chance for you to get shot out of the sky. And it's a gorgeous um, snowball. That's that's part of what the snowball is about. Um, the whole economy is a lie with unlimited time because you will always recover health and always get more gold. Oh my God, that's so true. That is so true. As soon as... Because the economy requires you to have those three things playing off each other, as soon as you let players just rest infinitely, there's no stakes. Because unless you're actually getting TPK'd in a fight, which, like, again, 5th edition, that is super hard to do, um, especially past level 1. But even at level 1, it's not, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, they will always have more. Oh, that's really good. So 5B needs hard moves. Now, Barry, let's... Okay. I, I want to talk about solutions later, but I love I love 5B's hard moves as an idea. Um, <laughs> infinite rest is the... Yeah, fuck. I, I am operating on an hour and a half of sleep after a day of work. I am... Infinite rest would be my dream right now. I traded uh, health and time for gold today. And I hope that a lot of you did that. Hey, Luke, we can talk about fronts later. Um, that goes there, Luke. And you said hard moves, didn't you, Barry? So let's put this here. Um, okay, so here's the issue. Here's the issue that I need to acknowledge at this point. I understand the realities of publishing. I understand that we can't have... So Storm King's Thunder is uh, an adventure about giants invading towns, and at the end of every fight, the players save the town. And they get all these things, and then they get led by the town to the next quest. There's actually a bit in Storm King's Thunder um, Page 32, I think it's on. Yes, okay. I had this on up. I was really well fed. Um, so uh, this is in Storm King's Thunder. You go to save this guy called Morak from a from a um, cave. This is like the introductory adventure. Um, if Morak dies, choose another NPC to give the quest in his place. It is fucking meaningless. If Morak dies, shrug, find another way to give it to them because they need it. This this is the issue, is that I understand the complexities of publishing where we don't have infinite pages and we need games to... Players need games to feel like they are a certain length. So, because players are paying $60 for these hardcovers, um, you can't... You can't have an experience where you... So um, choose your own adventure books are really cool. And sometimes you flick through and you die three pages in. But luckily you had your finger in the back so it didn't count and then you can turn back. Um, you can't really do that canonically in D&D &D without a whole lot of... Yeah, oh shit, Barry, let's talk about that too. Um, you can't do that in D&D &D without a whole lot of problems. Um, Morrowind actually does this. when you. So I think in Skyrim... I think in Skyrim, uh, Elder Scrolls V, when you kill a, a an important quest NPC, they just go unconscious and then they come back. But in Morrowind, which was three, I want to say, um, the character with its it would come up and say, "With this character's death, the thread of prophecy is severed." And I think the the full text was reload a previous save or live in this sorrowful world that you've created or something like that. Like it's really um, 
it's it's really dour about it. And what I love about that is is the implication of a previous save, which we don't we don't do traditionally in in games in D and D and stuff like that. So we want we want to in, d endure these consequences, but the games have to be built so resiliently that there actually is no consequence, and that this this fucking Morax shit, this um if your if your characters actually fail just make them succeed anyway is oh my god whether whether or not whether or not the characters accept morax quest just continue with the next section um this <laughs> fucking true uh, Brian, I was really bad at the classic Fallout games, but yeah, I absolutely have done that more than once. Um, soft lock the game by having a, a, a character die. Um, so, so this is the issue: is that the function of big publishing that Wizards has to go through means that um, when we when when we produce these modules, they need to, um, they don't have the, the, they don't have the, they don't have either the staff, the time, the, they don't have the gold, the health or the time to write the book with the infinite possibilities that it needs. And this goes back to what I was talking before about, um, yeah, Zach, straight up, you have a blessing to ignore player actions and results and continue using this module, which, like, is the opposite of rule zero. What would that be? Rule infinity? Rule rule x power root minus one or whatever? Um, uh, so, oh, yeah, no, I'm fucking Fimbar. I'm going to jail for screen sharing $60 books. I really don't care. Uh, I'm going to D&D &D jail and I'm going to be super happy there. Um, so... Yeah, so this is the issue, is that D&D modules are built around how do you succeed, not if you succeed, but that is not the way that we're playing them. Um, and it's really, it's really frustrating. And it's, so here's a really good example of when this is done and done well, is right at the start of, um, uh, of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, there is a fight that players can choose to get involved in or not. Um, and if they don't get involved, wow, this is really hard to find. What's the character's name? Krentz. Okay, cool. So um, there are five members of Xanathar's Guild and there's... Um, Yagra Strongfist, a half-orc employed by the Zentarum, and they fight. And this fight is fail deadly. Someone someone is going to die. Um, oh, fuck. Oh, God. I just said this was good, and then I read the first two lines of this that I hadn't read before. Oh, that's disgusting. If the characters choose to join the fray, have everyone roll initiative, and then the fight is over by the time they push through the spectators. Oh, god damn it. I was trying to say good things about you, Dragon Heist. Why do you do this to me? Um, so this is really good, is that um, there's this dramatic moment. Krenz has three hit points remaining and is trying to escape, and the four other Xanathar guild members are poised to tackle her. You can pull her away, but it requires a strength check. If you don't, then Krentz might die. And if he dies, you won't meet him again in a later hideout. But if you do save him, so like this bit's cutscene bullshit, right? And then all of a sudden it gets this good bit where it's like, do a strength check. And if you fail this strength check, the fight continues. Yagra breaks this guy's neck and he's no longer in the story. And that's really cool because then there's a moment later in the in the sewer hideouts where you meet him and you're like, oh hey dude, like what's what's good? Um, I wonder if there's uh if it actually says like what he does or if it's just like 
Um, if Krentz escaped from the Yawning Portal, he's here as well. And if Krentz is, um, you know, he, he fucking rocks with the adventures. If they helped him, he gives him a chance to leave in peace. Uh, if, uh, and then he flees or surrenders, as he must. And that's really cool. Um, because that is that is a consequence. That is a perceivable consequence, right? Um, angry character is about to kill this guy. What do you do? I hold her back. Roll a strength check. You fail. She breaks free. She kills the guy. That's cool. That's perceivable. And I love it. Uh, while I've been talking, you've been having all this fun in the chat. And I have been missing out. Um, yeah, d, &D uh, Utilization for D&D &D for modules will be town in a box or dungeon box. Okay. Yes, and I do want to talk about that in a second. Uh, I actually think that there's a, there is a way to do this, but I think it requires a bit more structure than we have at the moment. Um, with a quick time event. God, Zach, I like you. I, I haven't met you before, but you're fun. Um, or maybe I have. Um, finally, all the narrative excitement of quick time events. God, it's the best. Fucking good chat. Um, okay, so... Here's the thing. I understand that more text is more options. The Krent stuff is actually becomes almost a paragraph on its own that didn't need to be in there if we didn't have that moment of choice. So I understand that more text means more options, means more money, means less other content. And I understand that if every moment has this perceivable consequence, it can actually get um, pretty hard. So what I think is that it's not about building text, it's about providing tools. And this is where we're going to talk about what Finn, Barbary, and Luke were talking about before, about what can we do to make this better? What can we do in 5th edition to, um, to make it work? And here are some ideas that I've come up with. Um, some of them are the ideas you've come up with, and some of them you will tell me some more in the chat, I'm sure. So the first one I have is, um, if you're not willing to pull a trigger, don't put the gun on stage. Basically, if you're not willing to kill Floon, then say outright, Floon has been taken. They will not kill him. They will keep him alive to whatever, ransom him back. You have a lot of time. Don't stress. You like, don't lie to your players. Don't give them this illusion of choice. If you're not willing, if you, if you, if you put the gun on stage, you need to be willing to shoot it. And I think if you're not willing to kill Floon, because it's going to unravel so much of your of your story, it totally takes out like this whole um, section about having a house and then it builds into the second part of it. It's huge. If you aren't willing to do that, um, don't put it in there. And if you are willing to do that, if you do want to have it in there, um, Zach, as you say, um, put this moment in and then play to find out what happens and be honest and look through crosshairs. Um, and I keep using, I keep using apocalypse or terminology, especially, but PBTA terminology. I'm not, I'm doing that to compare them because I think they exist at different sides of the spectrum. I'm not doing that to say that one is better. I think that, I think that um, horseshoe theory, like we're a lot, we're a lot closer than we yeah, I mean, keeping secrets in games is bad. This That is really what this comes down to. Okay, so D&D has systems, right? D&D has systems about this, and it talks about it. Um, it talks about how Floon only has one hit point. So what if, what if every time PCs fail to roll, you rolled a damage die and took that, much, that many hit points away from Floon? What if you're like, okay... Um, he's being hit with fists. It's a it's a D four, um, and you. Oh, you you fail. Cool. I I roll my D four in front of you, um, or even behind the screen, but I roll it, and then I go, yep, cool, and I mark it down, and I just track that. I track how much health he has left based on the fact that he gets hit in the face every time you fail a roll, or maybe maybe he gets hit in the face by time chunks. And and D and D has this in it in already. We've got rounds, we've got minutes, we've got days or hours and days. We have we have linear time, which means that we can um, play it out by saying like, okay, well you know when you or not sorry we have uh, we have non-linear time um, because it's the it's it's the character's time, um, and we can say okay you know it's going to take you two hours to 
you you know that that Floon's going to bleed out in like six hours because you're a rogue and you've tortured people before. Um, do you want to spend four of those hours drinking with them to get the information that you need? Um, yeah, every time players take a long rest, roll damage against Floon. Um, okay, Barry, we are going to talk about that, but that is, yes, exactly where I'm going with it. Um, and what I like about this, what I like about using these inherent systems in D&D is that D&D is already scalable. We have a polygon system. You don't need to... Uh, you're not stuck. So in, in um, Apocalypse World, if you want to use dice, you're using D6 or 2D6. In D&D, we've got D4s and D6s and D12s and D20s and D100s, which means we have an almighty scalable number of solutions. If Floon has 26 hit points and I'm rolling a D4, they have a lot of time. If Floon has 26 hit points and I'm rolling D12s, they do not have a lot of time. And that is, that is uh, a perceivable consequence to the players that says something to the players and shows them how their how their actions on an endogenous level are interacting with the world <clears throat> um and i think that this is enforceable but unsupported by existing modules so uh finbar this goes back to something that you said before about um uh about whether this is a system problem or an adventure problem and i think i think it exists in the system. I don't know if it's the best way to do it, but it's not being used in adventures. And I think it is an adventure problem, but I think that it's based on the culture of how we do D and D, um, which is a system problem. Uh, yeah. So I think I think this version, this version of like using the inherent systems of damage die or time or a collection of two or you know gold gold health time um is an enforceable way there's also um uh there's also i think matt mercer did it i don't watch critical role but someone told me about it where he like at one point picks a um an hourglass up like a sand timer up and, and puts it on the uh on the table and the players just go fucking nuts because they understand that perceivable consequence right when that runs out bad thing happens cool we get it and they just start like yelling moves and like rolling dice and being like, ah, I do, I do strength 20. I, I do. And it's, and it's um, engaging for them because they understand what is at stake and they understand what the limitations are. And then they act within those limitations to achieve the thing they want. Um, it's, I don't really recommend using real world time to do it because I think that's, um, I've never seen it work well myself. Uh, it often just descends into chaos, but if that's something you want to achieve, that is a good good way to do it. Um, yeah, Adrian, uh, I call it the PC's horizon, which is like, um, it's kind of like a pop-in from old Nintendo 64 games or old, um, <clears throat> old Dreamcast games uh, where it doesn't exist until you see it and then it, pops up and it's like hey i'm here now and you engage with it and then as you walk away from it it disappears again um okay so clocks barry you mentioned progress clocks um blades clocks are a really good way of doing things because they're a known quantity what i love about blades clocks and i should i should bring some up at least to talk about them blades in the dark is a heist game but that's irrelevant what's important about it is that um time is marked and progress is marked by the use of four, six, and eight segment or more clocks. What that means is that um, certain levels of success fill up certain amounts, certain levels of failure fill up certain amounts. Um, clocks 15. Um, oh my goodness, 11, 15. Okay, here we go. Now I'm going to go to John Harper Jail as well. Fucking great. Evil Hat Jail, I guess it would be. So these are progress clocks. Um, sneaking into the Blue Coat Watchtower, make a clock to track the alert level of patrolling guards. When the PC suffer consequences from partial successes or misrolls, you fill in segments until the alarm is raised. Two things are really important here is that 
One, we know how many segments the clock has. Two, we know what happens when the clock is filled. That's that's how progress clocks work. Imagine we set this up as there's a six segment clock uh, and it's called Floon Dies. And every time you fail a roll, you take two segments on it. That's it. That's like you can fail three rolls before he before he um, dies. This is also um, holy shit! I just realized there is a way of doing this in D and D fourth edition with skill challenges, which is you have to get a certain number of successes for a certain number of failures, or bad thing happens. It's still important that bad thing happens is known, and it's still important that players understand the fictional link in how they can use their skills. Maybe maybe, maybe a skill challenge is a better way of doing that. That's really interesting. I haven't had time to think on that, so I don't want to ponder it too much. But um, Blades Clocks are basically a skill challenge, which is can you succeed before you get a requisite number of failures? That's, that's So there you go. That is just a way of displaying it. When I used to do skill challenges in, in fourth and fifth editions, I would um, put tokens on a table and and be like I would have I would have three tokens on each side and when they succeeded I would just move one forward and then when they failed I'd just move one on the other side and um, yeah it's it's um, it's perfect for that sort of thing actually it's really good for um, as Adrian says there it's really good for montages um, it's also oh, thanks for subscribing too that was really nice um, it's really good for for montages and it's also really good for um, uh um playing it out full synchronous time because there's nothing that says a skill challenge has to occur in a in a small amount of time you can play a skill challenge across a whole session um oh luke luke you're gonna murder me i have not yet played headspace i i am aware of it and i know like i follow him out on twitter and we're like we uh, have chatted and I have it and it is something that I want to read and play. Um, I have read bits of it and I thoroughly enjoy what I've read, but I haven't had a chance to get it to the table and I don't want to read it until I'm ready to play it because I want to kind of experience that as part of the, the whole jam. Um, yeah. So Blake, you're exactly right. Like in, in this hunting floon thing, we could say you need three successes before you get three failures. Do you, you could, you could talk to people, you can, um, dodge through the crowd to, to chase tracks. You could um, find the sewer grate and figure out a way through, and that's that's really cool because that's that's really cool demonstrations of characters. It makes them act in the ways that they're strongest. Um, so maybe inherent D and D system, we say skill challenge. The important thing, the important thing that Waterdeep doesn't have that it lacks on this is the guts to pull the trigger if the skill challenge fails, and the f the trigger doesn't have to be Floon dies. It doesn't have to be dire. It can be um, uh, Floon loses a magic item or Floon gives up information that he had that was really critical. As long as, um, as, long as there are stakes, the players are aware of the stakes, the characters are aware of the stakes, I'll figure that out at a later date. Um, I should take both and then edit one in. So long as the players are aware of the stakes, even if the characters aren't. So long as the characters are aware of the stakes, even if the players aren't. There we go. We're sold. Um, then I don't think we we really mind. Skill challenges and blades clocks have the same advantage, which is they're a known quantity. Now, what if what if you're one of those DMs that doesn't want it to be a known quantity? What if you what if you want it to be unknowable? What if you want a bit of mystery in your mystery? What if you want to um what if you want to um uh, you know have this search through the city for Floon be super um implicitly escalating but unknowable? Luke, that's where you bring in fronts and um oh Oh, Adrian, Adrian, a three stage clock with early in time and late. I've always said that um, there are only two times you can arrive in RPGs, just in time or just too late. But I really like that as well. Um, 
early in time. I'm like, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Okay, uh, I can't ponder that too much longer, but that's I'm super all about it. Um, so fronts. Fronts are interesting. Um, Grim portents are a tool used in Dungeon World to describe uh, how the plans of the bad guy are progressing. Basically, it's it's how the... How do I not have Dungeon World on? Do I not have the PDF of Dungeon World on this thing? Wow. This is odd. Um, okay. Oh, no, there it is, Dungeon World. Under D for Dungeon World. Uh, so, um, Dungeon World's... Yeah, early you get flume before they get info out of him. On time they get info but Flume's alive. Yeah, cool. So it's um it's it's ten plus seven to nine six minus on um uh clocks, which I really like. That's really interesting. Uh I look forward to the game that you designed that is just that. Okay, fronts page one eighty three. We're gonna talk about Grim Portance. Grim Portance are really important. Oh man. Why am I doing spreads? Um, okay, so I should have pinged Luke to be like, quickly write me a a description of fronts so that I can read that instead of thinking with my brain. Um, so fronts have dangers. The danger is the bad thing. In this case, the danger is the the person that's going to kill Floon. Right? Um, uh, they have an impulse. Their impulse is to kill Floon. It's an elaborate version of what if the dogs never arrive, a series of increasingly hypothetical and thus less committed what ifs. You are brilliant, thank you. That is exactly what I need. Um, so, there is an impending doom. The impending doom in our case would be Floon dies, but we are gonna talk about the white gate for now. Opening of the white gate. Okay, so we have uh, the College of Arcanists, the Cabal, um, they are they are going to open the white gate. That is our impending doom. Is that they are going to, um, yeah, they're going to open the white gate, and it's going to lead to tyranny and destruction and all these terrible things. So, um, grim portents. The college sends an expedition to the gate. The key is discovered. The gate's power is harnessed. The college seizes control. Now, the way that I read and play. Uh, Grimportance is that these are things that happen in the world when players fail in such a way that the story progresses, um, that the that the macro uh, failure is coming to pass. But importantly, these are perceivable by the characters. Um, the key is discovered doesn't mean anything if it happens off screen. Uh, Dungeon World does have the think off screen um, prompt principle as much as everything else does. Um, but I believe in my heart of hearts, and Luke, you may disagree. I'm interested to hear your opinion on this. Um, uh, I'm actually interested to hear everyone's opinion on this because I'm sure everyone's played at least a little bit of Dungeon World because we're all fucking fantasy nerds. Uh, I think the grim importance should manifest in a way that is perceivable by the characters or at least by the players, but yeah, definitely by the players at least, uh, maybe by the characters if we can. Um, and that's that's the difference between, if it doesn't happen on screen, it isn't important. Okay, beautiful. That's my my reading of it, but I'm really glad that that's, uh, that, that is true. Hashtag true. Yeah, visible on the edges. Even if you don't see it, so, um, a grim portent might be a dragon burns down the town. The players don't have to see the town. They don't have to see the dragon. But when they meet someone from a traveling caravan, they're like, oh, yeah, we just came from the other place where the dragon burnt down the town. Um, and it's cool. It's cool like that. So that is grim portents. Um, they're implicit and implicit. 
an explicit escalation, but they're unknowable to the players, which is really important because you don't know how many grim portents I have until um, Floon dies. And so I might say the first grim portent is um, a piece of Floon's clothing is found bloody and torn. The second grim portent is Floon's screams are heard echoing through the city. Um, and, you know, I might have... I might have three of them. Three is a good number. And then the fourth one is Floon dies. That's our impending doom. Uh, destruction, death. Now, you don't know how many how many Grimportants I've got. So when you get to that second one, Floon screams, you might think, shit, that one sounds really dire. This is, we need to succeed at the next thing. And that's, that's how you can keep that bit of mystery while still um, showing the perceivable consequences. Again, um, really important stuff that happens one it's presented to the characters in such a way that it is it is perceivable and two if they fail to overcome it it occurs in such a way that it is a consequence yeah uh i do a really similar thing to uh luca though i often i often don't put in how it's real to the players uh straight away because i don't no, because that's so dependent on how the world is occurring at the time. Uh, if you're not from the director, director's spectator stance and cutting away to remote scenes, if we want to show you something. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Adrian, I do a really similar thing. I'm very big on, like, uh, cinematic language and off-screen and credits and all that sort of stuff. Um, the issue is this is specifically about d, &D which as a culture and not a group of people that do a lot of things that characters don't see. So this is kind of like tools for people who, uh, like how can we write D&D modules in ways that they're going to be interactable at the table for people who normally play them? Um, basically it's how can we write better D&D modules, not how can we uh, change the, the underlying culture of how d, &D is played uh, to make these modules acceptable. Um, <clears throat> and the last one I want to talk about is Macchiato Monsters and Risk Die because it's a fun way of doing it and it kind of blends a couple of them. Macchiato Monsters is a... 2019, I think, the actual one was released. Maybe 2000 and uh da, 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 that's black hack where's macchiato yeah um uh, macchiato monsters was released in 2018 first edition um but it's been going for a couple of years um yeah straight up straight up um macchiato monsters is an old school game it is an osr game and it has a tool called risk dice Risk dice represent a threat or dwindling resource. Uh, that dwindling resource could be health, uh, time, or gold. Um, dwindling resource, we replace it with the delta. So delta four, delta six, delta eight. On a result of one to three, the die is stepped down, meaning that it 12 becomes a 10, 10 becomes an eight. If a risk die is stepped down below four, it fizzles. The die is gone. That's when the bad thing goes down so an example of this is in our equipment we have uh a hand crossbow which has risk eight bolts what this means is that every time at the end of every of every combat or if we do certain maneuvers with the hand crossbow we will roll a d8 if it is a one two or a three it steps down to a d6 that doesn't do anything that doesn't change how we interact with it except that it um it steps down and it gets one step closer to fizzling out once it's fizzled out we're out of bolts and we need to go and buy more that's that's how risk die work what i love about risk die as opposed to progress clocks is that uh two things one they let us play with the fun the funny shaped die which i love I love me some funny shaped die and my uh, adoration for PBTA has meant that I can't play with them as much. Um, the second thing it does is it's not linear. So blades clocks are linear. 
you um when you succeed at a risky roll with standard effect you tick two segments later when you only have two segments left a standard roll with risky effect will also tick two segments when you have risk die a a d12 risk die has a one in four chance of uh landing on the one to three that is going to step it down a d4 risk die has a one in four chance of not disappearing it has a three in four chance of landing on the bad news and so risk die have this um sense of um safety escalating this ramping ramping up of tension where you say you put a d8 in the middle of the table and you say when this runs out floon dies you uh roll it every time you you take an action and if you fail you roll it again and players are like sure charisma okay no it's a seven and that's a four and that's a five and it's fine it's, it's a d8 we've got all these numbers on it and then someone throws a one and it goes down to a d6 and all of a sudden you've got a 50 50 chance of fucking it away and then you do because it's a 50 50 chance and you go down to a d4 and then you have a three in four a, a, a 75 percent chance of killing flute with your next throw um by the way there's uh, a really other special thing that having the players roll the die does, which is it invokes a sense of complicity. Um, it's their fault. If if um, uh, uh, if if a player, okay, if if you're rolling damage die and you roll it and you turn look up at the player and you're like, yeah, man, that was the last one. Floon died because you know he took he took an extra hit point. They're like, ah, oh, that's unlucky. If a player picks up the d4 and rolls it and gets a four they feel like they have done a thing to help the team and if they pick up a d8 and they roll a one they feel like they have personally fucked up it's not fair that's not a reality but it is um it is a, an emotional um hook that players have when it comes to uh, rolling dice and that is another reason that risk die are so amazing because you can assign them to players. You can say, this is your responsibility, engage with this. And because it's your responsibility, when you fail, it will be your fault. So I would love to see a risk die death spiral in a D&D &D game. I think that would be really special. I think it would require, I think it's a mechanic that D&D &D doesn't have that would be beneficial and uh, were I to write a D&D module, I would try to find a way to put it in there, even even if just as an optional rule, to expose the culture to it. Because I think it I think it could do that much good. Um, yeah. So uh, Adrian, regards D&D being rooted in the here and now in front of PCs. One thing I've also found is that D&D. Uh, players culturally are very resistant to asynchronous play. They're very resistant to, um, okay, we're going to jump ahead uh, two years. And players will be like, well, surely I get extra proficiencies. And like, mate, can you, can you stop? Can you stop bringing everything back to like what your character was doing for two years? Like maybe you just settle down with a family for a bit. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the the here and now of it is such a such an issue um dnd's frame through literary aesthetics rather than cinematic ones that's interesting literary aesthetics rather than cinematic ones like that's very interesting uh sort of point in the module format is that they have fairly consistent presentations so they can be chained together and changed yes brian yes that is very true um but it is also very boring <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong, but I don't care, <laughs> frankly. If because this is what I was saying before about um about uh engaging with the text as text and not as a piece of play culture. Yes, I could engage this as a piece of play culture and acknowledge the fact that a lot of GMs are going to be doing design work at the table and are going to be solving these problems anyway. So therefore it's not actually a relevant uh issue. But no, I don't think I don't think that's I I don't 
I don't accept that as the only way to read um, these modules. I'm really happy as uh, with, with my critic hat on, with my designer hat on, I would probably look at it a different way, with my critic hat on to say, um, yeah, you know, do not, um, like, let's look at this as a single, as a singular piece of text. Um, I was just getting distracted there because I saw the next one, which is replace death saves with wrist die could be amazing. What I really like about that uh, death saves with wrist die thing is if it was persistent. So like the first time you went down, you were rolling D12s. And then if you ever step down to a D8, the next time you go down, you start at D8. Um, and so it's like a constant succumbing to, and it's something that really cool, because they used to do that with like losing points of constitution or something like that. Um, and then when you hit zero constitution, you died. But what I like better about that is that um, it doesn't affect your gameplay otherwise. So you can be a barbarian who goes in and charges in and, and gets yourself knocked down. Uh, and you can end up on like a D4 risk die. And even though that's existing in the back of your head, you're still a really strong character that can engage. So yeah, over the over the character's whole lifetime, over the player's whole lifetime, <laughs> over the character's whole lifetime. Yeah. So um, I think that would be really cool. I think, ah, oh, hey, Nova. Nova. Um, everyone, we have a funded Kickstarter developer in chat. Look at this. Look how popular we are. Um, yeah, look at when you say that's letting designers with the hook for their decisions execution, you're talking about, um, talking about consistent presentation and the fact that we could accept that GMs are doing design work, um, darker settings like dark sun. Yes. Okay. That's the other thing. That's the other thing too. You're doing Blake, which is great, which is different classes could have different risk die for death and different, um, settings could have a different risk guy. So in um, Tomb of Annihilation, where the death curse is this really important thing. What if we just said that, um, uh, what if we just said that, like, the death curse is such an important thing, everyone's risk die is D6. Like, that's the meat grinder of it, right? Um, Tomb of Annihilation has meat grinder rules, and they, they, they're kind of shit. Um, not because they're bad, but because they're not interesting. Um... The meat grinder rules for Tomb of Annihilation say a death saving throw succeeds on a roll of 15 or higher instead of 10 or higher. That's like, that's shit. That's so boring. That's all we're, all we're doing is just upping the DC of death, right? Imagine if it was like, no, you now start on a D6. You have to, you have a 50 50 chance of putting yourself in a position where you have a 75% chance of dying. That'd be cool. Yeah, Zach, I don't think you're wrong. Um, the sales pitch on static modules is they help new DMs have something to run, but they teach the same new DMs a bunch of bad habits. And I think that's my issue here, is that it is content. It is helpful. Honestly, I would love to I would love to run um, a version of Waterdeep uh, as a Blades in the Dark heist. I think that would be really cool. Uh, thank you for subscribing, Luke. Um, you're the best. So I think I think it'll be really cool to have a version of, of Waterdeep where we play it in a Blades in the Dark or a, uh, a Band of Blades or like something something you know kind of heisty or or, or teamworky, um, and we basically use the text as inspiration. I would really like that, but I also am not like that's not what I'm talking about. And, and I know that's that's what you're saying, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this is a text that was produced by Wizards that says, if you run this, you will have a good adventure. And what I'm saying is, fundamentally, if you run this, you are engaging in bad play culture. So take that, Mike Mills. Um... By the way, I've run out of um, things that I want to talk about. Um, uh, apart from my outgoing, so uh, I'm just I'm just working with you all here. Um, when everyone gets tired, we can <laughs> stop. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, and and Luke, you've, you've hit it on on the head, which is that. Um, uh, okay, M my position as someone who wants to be an RPG critic, who wants to establish RPG criticism, 
I feel like it's a bit of a Sisyphean task, um, the boulders going up the hill, because there's no culture of it. There's no culture of analysing these things. People have been looking at... People have been watching film for entertainment for decades, and they've also been um, engaging with them critically for decades. And I feel like we've got the entertainment bit, but we don't have the critical bit for RPGs. And what that means is that... Um, uh saying that you know readers bring their own perspective to text so we can't do literary criticism on the text is written at all is kind of how the rpg culture has been talking about it um and i don't agree with it i i know that play is an important part of the rpg experience but i don't think that that means that the text is not ripe for criticism again just reinforcing it because we don't have the culture yet i'm talking about like capital c criticism about like critique not criticism like saying that it's bad specifically um water deep is an incredibly engaging adventure that begins with a beautiful bang unfortunately that bang is a lie and that's my issue um yep um yeah, no, but there's a there's a there's a reality to that binary system of, uh, and I, as one very happy person, will say, "Fuck the binary." Um, there is a there uh, in D and D stakes are ablative, hit points. So um, we mentioned those three, those three um, uh, resources before. Gold is really the only one that kind of matters in terms of volume if you have enough time for a long rest it doesn't you could have six weeks or you could have eight hours but if you have enough time for a long rest it's a long rest if you have see you barry have a go on mate if you have enough health to be on your feet if you have one hp you have health gold is really the only one that goes up and down and like fluctuates based on volume because you're purchasing things with it right um but for the other two, you have that that binary consequence. Do you have um, just uh, one hit point, or do you have no hit point? Yeah. Um, oh shit. Um, yes, um, misdirected mark. And okay, so let's talk about let's talk about leading reading lists. Um, Daughter ideology. I do want to talk to you about that in a second, but I do want to talk about reading lists because. Misdirected Mark, Stop, Hack, and Roll are both very good for this. Um, and also the uh, International Journal of Role-Playing published a piece about the invisible rules of role-playing, the social framework of role-playing process by Marcus Montola. It is a very good piece that talks about the difference between player goals and character goals and how that interacts with um, the elusive game world. And it is a beautiful exploration of... Um, something that's very true of D and D, which is that um, player goals and character goals are often the same thing in that experience, uh, and it's very interesting. And I would recommend reading it. Um, yeah, I just want to bring literary analysis to TRPGs. It's not that fucking hard. That's all I want to do. Um, that's all I want to do. Yeah, hopefully, playing a game requires you to engage the thing and identify with it at some level. That person is very fast is how fully playing a game requires you to engage with it, with the thing and identify with it at some level. Yes, okay. Zach, you're entirely right. Um, one of the reasons that RPG critique is so hard at the moment is that the designers are very difficult to discuss critique with because they... Oh, man, we're getting way off topic. Because they... Um, maybe we should do an RPG critique Q&A at a later date. That'd be fun. Um RPG designers have very emotional investment in their work because there's usually not a lot of money, so it's usually a labor of love. Uh, it's also usually only one person or a small group. It's not like film is where you have, you know, at least 16 people on, you know, little indie films and stuff like that. Um, and even then you saw smaller directors getting very emotionally attached to um, the everyone's response to the work they do. Um, and it's also a small audience, which means that one person's opinion can mean a lot. It's also a fairly quiet audience that plays it at home, which means that um, one person's loud, negative opinion 
can engage a lot. I actually, I actually don't want to go too much more into RPG critique. Um, and um, and uh, daughter ideology, I might just talk to you offline if uh, if you don't mind um, about my stuff, which is which is absolutely lovely. I would love to talk about that. But first off, I just want to tell you who I am and that sort of stuff. So um, who I am again is I am Sydney Icarus. I am a struggling tabletop game designer who makes content about the struggles of producing tabletop games. I am currently involved in the Drawing the Owl pilot series, of which this has been a very fun and successful piece. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Action Economy, which is where everyone found me, or you can find 16 people at DMs in the players. True that. Um, and playtesters. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at uh, Sydney Icarus, um, which is this, this YouTube. Just click this thing. Um, how you can support me, you can support me by subscribing to my channel, by, you know, liking videos, by commenting on them. It sounds uh, like a bit of a nothing, but it's about boosting visibility and YouTube is algorithm driven. And if you engage with it, it drives me up the algorithm and allows more people to see it. And at the moment, what we need to do is build an audience for this kind of discussion, uh, which I am very, so very grateful that the eight people here were. Um, how else can you support me? You can go to itch.io forward slash Sydney Icarus and you can link in the description and you can, um, Purchase Riders Last Rides, which is a fun game about uh, the dying and what they leave behind, and how we come to terms with um, with that as a as a group of people. Um, and it is incredibly fun and also heartbreaking at the same time, and I love that. Um, thank you all for being involved in this. I think we will have to do some more, right? Because it was certainly more productive having other people here to talk to. Uh, than it was. Thank you, Pat. You're so wonderful. Um, certainly was a um, a really great experience, and I think this is something we can do more of in the future. Um, as this is the pilot season, I'm looking for more ideas and more things. So if you've got something you want to talk about, get in touch with me. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, send me a DM, uh, slide into my DMs, or just um, at me, and we'll have a bit of a chat. Uh, and it'll be awesome. I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy this. And if it wasn't 10 past midnight, I would do this forever. Hey, Tom made it too. This is really cool. I love the idea we get like this little crew of people. This would mean the world to me. Oh my God, this would be so much fun. Um, okay, I need to get to bed and I need to let, let Luke get to bed and I need to let uh, all you Americans get to work or whatever it is that you do with your lives. Um, Blake, you also need to get to bed. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you again. And uh, if you ever need anything, um, get in touch with me. Uh, I'm going to say it because I have been and I hate myself for doing it, but it's great. Um, this is Drawing the Owl, which is a show about failure and trying again. And uh, if you've been making something, if you've been designing something and it doesn't, it doesn't look like what you want it to look like, I can only recommend that you keep, keep giving a hoot.